Well, hi there. Today's video is sponsored by Reach Out Reptiles and what I would consider to be the best pet snake in the world. But more about them in a bit. This is a marsupial. And so is this. And so is this. And so is this. And this one might be back soon. Marsupials are, as we foreshadowed in our video about the Afrotherians, the greatest rival to the Afrotheria for diversity and weirdness within the mammals. This group is so much cooler than you even know. And a big part of the reason for that is because, like the Afrotheria, they were the only mammals present on a large island continent for a very long time. This means that, like the Afrotherians, they filled most of the niches filled by other mammal groups elsewhere. And the island continent where most extant marsupials live is Australia and its nearby islands. But surprisingly, Australia is not where they originated. They haven't even been there all that long. In fact, the placental mammals possibly arrived in Australia first. And guess where the marsupials came from? Antarctica. But that's not where they originated either. In fact, the oldest fossils of marsupials are from Asia and North America. They date back to the early Cretaceous, perhaps even the Jurassic. So clearly, we've got a big story to tell. And we've got to take a look at all of the extant marsupials and one group that promises to be back soon. But first, let's talk about where marsupials as a group fit in with the other mammal groups. Mammals, as we have discussed before, are the hagfish of reptiles. They are synapsids, more closely related to modern reptiles than they are to anything else alive today, but not as closely related to the reptiles as the reptiles, including birds, are to one another. Together with the reptiles, they comprise the living members of the amniota. Amniotes are unified not only by shared ancestry, but by the amniotic egg. Shelled eggs with many membranes that allow amniotes to reproduce far away from water by effectively bringing the pond with them. When discussing the amniotic egg, I usually ask my class if they were to, say, spend the next six weeks in a bathtub full of water, what they would need to bring with them to survive the experience. Generally on the list are food, clean water, a bag for um, waste, and a dry suit or something to keep you somewhat isolated. Well, this is pretty much exactly what we find in an amniotic egg. The bathtub itself is made of a shell and a membrane just inside the shell called the chorion. If you've ever eaten a boiled egg, you are probably familiar with the chorion. Remember the chorion. It will come up again here in just a minute. But the shell and chorion are somewhat permeable to air, but do not allow much water exchange. Food and water are provided by the yolk, also called the vitiline. Remember that one too. The poop sack is called the Alantois. It's French, but I always remember its name because I remember how much I hate that sack of poop Alan Toas. Stupid Alan Toas. And just for the record, I, I don't actually know anyone named Alan Toas, but I did find several on Facebook, so I might have just made a few enemies. <laughs> Who wants to be friends with a guy named after a sack of poop anyway? And that dry suit, that would be the amnion for which the amniotic egg gets its name. So back to mammals. There are three large groups of mammals alive today. Monotremes, marsupials, and placental mammals. Though I find these names to be a bit misleading because two of the three have placentas. But the monotremes, they, they just lay perfectly normal amniotic eggs. The other two groups, the marsupials and the placental mammals, they don't. These two groups, as I just mentioned, have placentas. And you've probably heard of a placenta before. If you've ever attended a mammalian birth, there's a good chance that you've seen one before. You probably even made one once. But you probably don't really know what it is or what it does. Most people that I've met think that humans and other placental mammals are connected to their mother or their mother's blood supply during pregnancy. The problem is that this wouldn't work. Mom has an immune system that seeks out things inside of mom that aren't mom and kills them. So does baby. If mom's blood went into baby, mom's immune system would kill baby and baby's immune system would kill mom's blood. This is why you can't get an organ or blood transplant or transfusion from just anyone. But baby does get nutrients and oxygen from mom's blood and disposes of waste in the same way. 
And baby does this by getting its blood close enough to mom's blood so that diffusion can occur between them. And the placenta is the embryonic and fetal structure that gets baby's blood so close to the blood in the wall of the uterus that this can occur. Now, I mentioned that both marsupials and placental mammals have placentas. For this reason, I prefer to refer to the placental mammals as eutherians. I'm fine calling marsupials marsupials, but I also frequently refer to them as metatherians, though metatheria is actually a larger group than marsupalia. There are non-marsupial metatherians, such as this guy, Thylacosmilus. However, today, the only extant metatherians are marsupials. So the two terms, metatherian and marsupial, can be used somewhat interchangeably when discussing extant metatherians. The real takeaway is that the marsupials and the eutherians are two different groups of placental mammals. But it is important to note that there are also two different kinds of mammalian placentas. One formed from the chorion and the yolk, or the vitellin, called the choriovitellin placenta. The other formed from the chorion and the allantois, called the choriolantoic placenta. And I wish I could say that marsupials have one and eutherians the other, but that's only partly true. It is the case that marsupials, well, they always have a choriovitellin placenta. And eutherians, they've always got a choriolantoic placenta. But bandicoots also have a choriolantoic placenta in addition to their choriovitellin placenta, despite being marsupials. And many eutherians develop a choriovitellin placenta before the choriolantoic placenta develops. So, well, it's just not that simple. But what you probably noticed is that the choriovitellin placenta in mammals with both develops first and only works during early development. And that is because the choriovitellin placenta is low in surface area and can only support a very small embryo. Which is why a newborn deer looks like this, and newborn kangaroos like this. Did you notice the difference? Marsupials, due to their general lack of a choriolantoic placenta, must be born extremely premature, at least by eutherian standards. And that probably begins to explain the most famous feature of marsupials, the pouch, which is possessed by most, but surprisingly not all, marsupials. But a pouch makes sense in many cases because that baby isn't ready for the cold and dangerous world just yet. It crawls up into the pouch, finds a nipple, something that monotremes lack, though they do make milk, and stays there for a very, very long time. Lactation is by far the longest portion of the early development of marsupials, whereas gestation is the longest part for most eutherians. So now that you know why marsupials make their way into pouches, let's talk about how they made their way from Antarctica to Australia, and how they got to Antarctica in the first place, and why there weren't any eutherians when they showed up. As we mentioned earlier, the eutherian and the metatherian lineages diverged somewhere between the middle of the Jurassic and the beginning of the Cretaceous, way before Tyrannosaurus rex even existed. But the earliest fossils of metatherians come from Cretaceous deposits in Asia and North America, which is odd given that well, marsupials are generally associated with Australia and, to a lesser degree, South America. In fact, mainland Asia and North America combined only possess two species of a single group of marsupials, the order Didelphomorphia, opossums, and none of them are in Asia. Most are actually found in South America. And the two species in North America actually migrated here from South America. Which is funny because South America got its metatherians from North America. And now North America only has metatherians because it got a few back from South America when South America and North America came back into contact just a few million years ago. Opossums are the most distantly related group of marsupials alive today, in that all of the other marsupials are more closely related to one another than they are to the opossums. Opossums are not to be confused with possums, which are more closely related to all of the other marsupials than they are to opossums, and live on, well, the other side of the planet. While we only have one species in the United States, opossums are the most speciose marsupial lineage in the Americas, with around 93 described species. 
Though Virginia opossums are larger than most people would think, opossums generally are somewhat small, with the largest getting to be about the size of a house cat. Most of them spend some time on the ground and some time in trees, though there is a semi-aquatic water opossum, which is now one of my favorite creatures. Their feet are plantigrade, and many have prehensile tails, and both their feet and tails often have scutes, and their hind feet have an opposable kind of a toe thumb with no claw. They generally have long, skinny heads with large sagittal crests and buckets of teeth. 50 to be specific, with tricuspid molars. And they like to show them off when frightened, though they're very uninclined to bite. While most species have pouches, not all do, but they do have the bifurcated penises and vaginas possessed by, well, most marsupials, so that's a plus. These come in handy because most opossum babies never make it to a nipple to nurse. Opossums just have a ton of babies and hope that a few make it to nutrients. And while that may seem sad, when your babies are born less than two weeks after mating, well, those are just the breaks. But the reality is that despite originating in the northern hemisphere, for most of the existence of marsupials, all of the other marsupial lineages today are relegated to the southern hemisphere, with South America serving as the hub of all marsupial distribution. This includes the next most distantly related clade of extant marsupials, the order Pausitubriculata, seven species of shrew opossums which, like the possums that we will discuss shortly, are more closely related to all of the other marsupials than they are to opossums. Meaning that shrew opossums are more closely related to possums than they are to opossums. So shrew opossum, is, it's a terrible name for them. Though they do look a lot like shrews. They have tiny eyes and skinny faces. And they fill the basic niche of shrews as shrews were absent from South America until South America reconnected with North America about three million years ago, when the true opossums made their way up to North America, high-fiving shrews as they passed one another. But basically, if you're in the Andes Mountains and you find a creature that looks and acts like a shrew, but it's a marsupial, it's not an opossum, but it is a shrew opossum. And that brings us to the last order of South American marsupials alive today. An order represented by a single extant species, the order Microbiotheria. Despite the fact that the one species, the Monito del Monte, is found in Chile and Argentina, all of its closest living relatives are not found in South America at all. They left. They are more closely related to the Australian marsupials than they are to any of the other extant American marsupials. The Monito del Monte, meaning little monkey of the mountain, really does seem like a pygmy marmoset and an opossum had a baby. They are arboreal with grabby little hands and feet, prehensile tails that are furred on top and naked below, dense fur with large eyes surrounded by dark rings, and 50 teeth, just like an opossum. Like I said earlier, their closest living relatives are not found on this side of the planet. They are simply the last surviving species in South America of a lineage well, that colonized Australia. But you may have noticed that Australia is not very close to South America, and hasn't been for a very long time. You can't just walk from South America to Australia. However, before about 50 million years ago, you could walk from South America to another continent that we often forget about, Antarctica. Not only was it close, but it was a tropical paradise of sorts, and marsupials from South America were doing great down there. And Antarctica, which was previously connected to Australia as well as South America, was still very close to the land down under. It was actually just down under the land down under, to, to be more specific. Not close enough to just walk over, but close enough that colonization from Antarctica was not completely impossible. And it may have only happened one time. Which explains why all of the marsupials in Australia and its neighboring islands all form a single clade found there and nowhere else. The biggest order within this single Australian clade, called the Eometatheria, is also the largest of all extant metatherian orders, with around 155 species. And that order would be the clade Diprodontia. This clade includes many familiar marsupials such as kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, koalas, couscouses, and other possums, not to be confused with opossums or shrew opossums. 
I would actually really like to make a whole video just about this clade, especially considering that this group includes the now extinct marsupial lion, which is not a lion any more than the shrew opossum is a shrew. It is now composed of herbivores, insectivores, and omnivores. There are two fairly conspicuous features that identify members of this group. First, their teeth, and second, their weird toes. This group is called the Diprodontia, meaning two front teeth. They don't have to want them for Christmas because the members of the Diprodontia, well, they have them. They have Diprodont teeth, specifically their lower incisors. They have two, only two and then a big diastema before the molars, similar to what you see in rodents. Most diprodonts have more than two upper incisors, but those two lower incisors are a strong indicator that what you have is a member of the diprodontia. But if you're still not sure, take a look at their toes. Not their front feet. Everything there looks pretty normal for a mammal. Take a look at their back feet. Now the feet of a kangaroo are all kinds of weird looking. In some ways, they look like the feet of a paleognath bird, like say an emu or a cassowary, or other theropods like Tyrannosaurus rex or Velociraptor. But if you take a long, hard look at the innermost toe, the one that Dr. Grant would call the middle toe, you might notice something odd. It has two claws on it. And this isn't just the case for kangaroos either. It's all of the diprodontia. They've all got it. Two toes fused together down to the last digit, resulting in what appears to be one toe with two claws. Syndactyly. And this, combined with the diprodont condition, will tell you that what you have is a true diprodont. And this group comes the closest of any marsupial group to recolonizing the ancestral Mediterranean homeland of mainland Asia. They make their way all the way up to the Salaire Archipelago, which is pretty much as far south as most Asian taxa go, and as far north as most Australian taxa reach. And it is the only part of the world where marsupials are eaten by the best pet snakes in the world, reticulated pythons. Now, reticulated pythons are not actually the best pet snakes because they get far too big and occasionally eat people. Actually, with the, some regularity, they eat people. But they would otherwise be the best pet snakes in the world. They are beautiful, hardy, intelligent, engaging snakes. They just get far too large. Well, uh, most of the time they do. But in the Salaire Islands, they experience something called insular dwarfism. They stay very small. I mean, like you can fit an adult into a coffee can kind of small, which means that a viable population can live on these tiny isolated islands in the Salaire Archipelago. But it also means that the perfect pet snake does exist. And since before anybody else really recognized why you would want a tiny retic instead of a 20 plus foot monster, Garrett Hartle of Reach Out Reptiles went all in on these most perfect of all pet snakes. Today, Reach Out Reptiles produces dwarf and super dwarf retics in about any size or color that you can imagine. And they are where I have gone for all of my super dwarf retics because, well, it turns out that super dwarf retics are more expensive than their giant mainland cousins because they make way better pets. So there is a financial motivation for someone to sell you a baby giant reticulated python and call it a super dwarf. This actually happens with some regularity. You don't even know you've been fooled until, well, a snake that was supposed to stay this size is 15 feet long and eating small livestock on a regular basis. That's why I go to Reach Out Reptiles, so I know exactly what I'm getting. We'll have a link to their website and their YouTube channel in the description. And if you mention this video when you order, they'll take 10% off of your purchase. Forever. So that's where I go to get what is, in all seriousness, like no hyperbole at all, the best pet snake I know to exist on planet Earth. The marsupial-eating, super dwarf reticulated python of the Slayer Archipelago. But there are still three major clades of Australian marsupials yet to be explored. These final three are all more closely related to one another than they are to anything that we've discussed to this point. And the clade most distantly related to the other two is the clade Notori Timorphia, the marsupial moles that we discussed in our video on Afrotheria. These, like the golden moles in the Afrotheria, are not moles. 
These are actually even more distantly related from the true moles than are the golden moles, which are more closely related to elephants than they are to moles. But these are marsupials. More closely related to the last two groups we have to cover than they are to anything else. But the two species of marsupial moles are, well, they're more closely related to kangaroos and even opossums than they are to true moles or golden moles, which are both eutherians. That said, the level of convergence is astonishing. If you are in Australia and you find what appears to be a mole, well, it isn't one. The two remaining clades are the two most closely related of any of the clades that we've discussed today. The smaller of these two groups will explain why we talked about both the teeth and the feet in Diprodontia. And the larger of the two will allow us to talk about these and when we might see them again. So let's start small and work our way to cryptozoology and de-extinction. Paramelomorphia. These are your roughly 20 species of bilbies and bandicoots. You've probably heard of these before, but if you're not from Australia or New Guinea, you've probably never seen one outside of a video game. Well, this is a bilby, and this is a bandicoot. They look a lot like elephant shrews and rabbit-eared elephant shrews, respectively. But of course, they're not elephant shrews. Elephant shrews, like golden moles, are more closely related to elephants than they are to bilbies or bandicoots. Heck, they're even more closely related to actual shrews than they are to bilbies and bandicoots, and they're not very closely related to shrews at all. Because bilbies and bandicoots are not eutherians. They're marsupials, but you probably know that by now. But, like we mentioned earlier, the bandicoots have, in addition to the choreovitaline placenta found in all marsupials, a chorioallantoic placenta. But it is smaller than those found in most eutherians, and it lacks the chorionic villi. Chorionic villi are small projections that finger out and greatly increase the contact area between the placenta and the uterine wall. What this means is that while bandicoots seem to be walking a similar evolutionary line to the eutherians, they are still born comparatively underdeveloped. So it's a good thing that they have a pouch, like most other marsupials. Though the pouches of bandicoots and bilbies are backward-facing, similar to those of wombats or koalas. A convergence, as those are both diprotodonts. And the closest relatives to the bandicoots and bilbies are, in my opinion, one of the coolest groups of marsupials on the planet. The Dazzy Euromorphia. This group includes the well-known Tasmanian Devil, which I had the pleasure to meet in the Australian Reptile Park in 2019 on my one day that I have spent in Australia in my life. It was a fantastic day. Thank you, Patreon. If you'd like to see more content from Australia, please consider supporting us on Patreon. But this group includes more than just the Tasmanian Devil. It also includes some of the Tasmanian Devil's closest relatives that are, well, not so well known, such as Quolls, Mulgaras, Kowaris, and many others. Not to mention numbats, which have to be one of the cutest animals on the planet. And though it is currently extinct, well, at least we think, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine. About 72 species total. Dazzy Euromorphians are carnivorous and subsequently have many morphological convergences with eutherians in the order Carnivora. I would honestly love to spend a whole video talking about just this group, also the Carnivora. So let me know in the comments if you're into that kind of thing. But a lot of these look like smaller carnivorans, like wolverines, weasels, and cats, as well as a large number that look basically like carnivorous mice or rats. And one group that is striped like a tiger, but looks, or at least looked, like a dog which, interestingly, may have been driven to extinction in Australia and New Guinea by the dingo itself, as well as the New Guinea counterpart to the dingo, the New Guinea singing dog, in addition to other factors. This would have happened just a little over 3,000 years ago, which is recently. Recently enough that we might be able to find enough DNA to bring them back, similar to what we discussed with the moas, elephant birds, and woolly mammoths. But there is a reason that we don't call these dog-like marsupials New Guinea or Australian tigers. Because there is a part of the range of the thylacine where dingoes and their caroling cousins were not introduced. Tasmania. Which is why it is often called the Tasmanian tiger or the Tasmanian wolf. Despite being far more closely related to a koala than it is to tigers or wolves, which are both eutherians. 
Tragically, like wolves throughout much of their range, they were viewed as a threat to livestock in Tasmania, and a bounty was placed on them. It is difficult to hunt species to extinction, but large carnivores are an exception because they can never exist in high densities like herbivores can. And being a low density, easy to spot animal on an island means there cannot be too many of them. The last thylacine verified to be alive died in a zoo in Tasmania in 1936. We have videos of these alive. This is less than 100 years ago. And a study of alleged sightings in Tasmania, published this year by Brooke and colleagues, suggests that they may not have gone extinct in Tasmania until the 1980s or even into the early 2000s. And some people still claim to see them from time to time in Tasmania. But if they're alive today, and they genuinely may be, that probably isn't the most likely place where they may be found. Heck, Australia is so large and much of it so remote that they could still be alive in Australia somewhere. But honestly, the place that is most likely, in my estimation, for them to still be alive today is in New Guinea. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, but it only has about 15 million people. For comparison, Japan is half the size of New Guinea and has 125 million people. It is heavily forested, and much of the island is completely inaccessible except on foot. And reports of sightings of thylacines by villagers in the remote parts of the island are not uncommon at all. If there was ever a place where a large nocturnal land predator could go undetected by the scientific community, the remote jungles of New Guinea, those seem like the place. But that isn't the only hope for the thylacine. Let's say that all of the thylacines are extinct. Well. We have specimens that we collected less than 100 years ago. We've been able to successfully extract DNA from these specimens since 2002 and recently sequenced their entire genome. In other words, if we clone them, we wouldn't need to fill any sequence gaps with frog DNA or nothing. And just starting last year, a major effort is underway to clone the Tasmanian thylacine. So even if they're gone, and I have my doubts about that, they may be back very soon. What group should we cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. An opossum is high on my list of mammals I would like to have as, a, as an educational outreach animal. You always see them doing their threat display, which yeah. is showing you their 50 teeth. But they don't, like you can stick your hand right in their mouth, they don't bite. You know, it's, that's, not, that's not where they go from there. They're just like, look at all these teeth. Well, how about this? Those are all their plans. Every vertebrate develops in a pond. Yeah. Uh, you know, the pond is still there. That's why when you're born, it becomes obvious when your pond breaks. <laughs>